The longer romantic lyric poems comprise some of the most beautiful poems ever written in English. They emerged with the Romantic movement at the end of the late 18th century, and they were something altogether new. They were similar to the Ode. The Ode is a three-part uh, long poem that has a stylized diction and subject matter, is usually addressed to someone or something. Um, but unlike the Ode, these longer romantic lyrics were kind of conversational. They were very similar to the conversation poems that Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth experimented with. Long poems written in blank verse, that is, lines of iambic pentameter that are unrhymed, and that deal with um, a certain feeling or mode of thought. These poems are written in a conversational idiom using the language of everyday speech. But not all of the longer romantic lyric poems fall into the category of conversational poems. It's certainly true for Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth's poems, but with the younger generation of romantics, Shelley, Keats, they begin to experiment with uh, lyrical intricacies with rhyme and uh, artifice. And so these longer romantic lyrics aren't exactly conversation poems either. They also bear similarities to the 18th century loco descriptive mode, which typically was a relatively long lyric poem dealing with a landscape or uh, describing a certain region. It was very grounded in space. Although there are some elements to this within the larger romantic lyric, it's not just loco description. They're more interested in thought and deep feeling and introspection and meditation rather than uh, just describing the landscape. And so for a while, critics didn't know what to call this. M.H. Abrams in 1965 wrote an essay in which he classified these poems as greater romantic lyrics, all of which share a certain commonality in structure and in theme. So these poems are all about meditation, all about the inward experience of thought. And they have this broader three-part structure that Abrams identifies. Abrams writes, some of the poems are called odes, while the others approach the ode in having lyric magnitude and a serious subject, feeling fully meditated. They present a determinate speaker in a particularized and usually localized outdoor setting, whom we overhear as he carries on in a fluent vernacular, which rises easily to a more formal speech, a sustained colloquy, sometimes with himself or with the outer scene, but more frequently with a silent human auditor, present or absent. The speaker begins with a description of the landscape. An aspect or change of aspect in the landscape evokes a varied but integral process of memory, thought, anticipation, and feeling which remains closely intervolved with the outer scene. In the course of this meditation, the lyric speaker achieves an insight, faces up to a tragic loss, comes to a moral decision, or resolves an emotional problem. Often the poem rounds upon itself to the end where it began, at the outer scene, but with an altered mood and deepened understanding, which is the result of the intervening meditation. There's first this meditation on the outward scene, that's the loco descriptive element, and then they turn from that scene to go inward, to think, to feel, to remember, and it's this part of the poem that the speaker is really interested in. And then after the meditation, this inward turn, it turns outward again to the landscape, but with a renewed and altered sense of consciousness. These poems are extraordinary because they, they embody the feeling of thought and the motions of thought within the turns of a lyric poem. And they're really something new that was introduced into uh, the tradition of English literature. So we'll see this three-part structure in the poems that we'll look at in this series. Um, Coleridge's Frost at Midnight begins with a meditation on the outward scene, uh, the nighttime, the sounds of the owls, the fire burning, and then he'll turn inward to this memory of his school days, and then he'll turn outward to address his sleeping infant, Hartley Coleridge, and imagine what greater education through nature Hartley will have. Wordsworth's Tintern Abbey has the same movement. It begins with a meditation on the Y Valley, looking at the ruins of Tintern. Then he turns inward to reflect on the memory and meditation on how these forms of beauty have influenced him and made him who he is. And then he returns outward to his sister, Dorothy. 
In Shelley's Ode to the West Wind, Shelley does the same thing, meditating upon how the wind is moving the dead leaves. And, and then he, he turns inward with this problem, how, does, how can I interact with the West Wind? How can I ask that the West Wind inspire me? And so this meditation produces a resolution to his problem as he turns in prayer in the final movement to the wind itself. Keats' Ode to the Nightingale that begins in darkness. The speaker hears the nightingale, he imagines it in some melodious plot, and then he's transported by fancy and imagination into the realm of the nightingale. And he spends some time there in thought, in feeling, in this strange liminal space, and then returns again when the spell is broken. And he's left wondering, what state of consciousness did I just experience? So it's, it's, they're, they're all very interested in this experience with nature, with experience with other humans, and how to really bridge the gap between uh, humanity and, and nature. You remember that these poems are written during the rise of the industrialization. We see urban centers sprawling, and we see commons being closed, and uh, there's this disconnect between human work, human living, and nature, and in a way these poems are attempting to bridge, to partly speak to this moment in human history. And so they, they have a special resonance for us today who are very much grandchildren of the Industrial Revolution now in the technological age. As you're experiencing the beauty of these poems, you, you may get lost intellectually. Uh, it's very easy to get lost in these poems, but I'm hoping that these close readings will um, reveal uh, not just the sense of what's being thought and said within the language, but also the artistry and the beauty of it, and how this is really a mode of expression that can only be experienced in poetry. The more you read these poems, the more you return to them, the more they'll keep giving back. These poems are like beautiful landscapes themselves. You'll want to return to them in different lights, to see them in different atmospheres, in different times of day. So throughout your life, you can return to these poems and really feed on them for the rest of your life. So I hope you enjoy these videos, and I hope as you're studying and reading these poems that you'll come to uh, a sense of their beauty and also to allow them to enrich your own life. So thanks for joining me, and I'll see you all in the next video.